So this is part of a le lecture series on basic machine learning and the slides and the notebook I will be using are available to download from our GitHub repository. And you can access that from the same page where you saw the announcement for this event. There's, there's links below where the direction to the library was. And so you can download the content there. If you want to run the notebook during my talk, you can, of course, do it any way you like. But if you want a free cloud service, you might look into something called Google Colab. And then after the talk, we go to IHOP nearby here. So if you, anybody wants to join us. And also there is a feedback form, again, on the same page with the announcement for this event. So if you want to request topics for the future or any comments you want to make to help us to uh, improve uh, the group, happy to hear it. Um, also, if you want to continue the discussion, I have my email here on the first slide. I love talking about machine learning and data science, so feel free to uh, send me an email anytime and uh, we can continue the discussion. Okay, so with that out of the way, then, and oh, one, one other thing. So I am recording this, uh, this talk. So just so you know, and I'm gonna post the recording on uh, our YouTube channel. And so if you wanna, wanna go back and revisit, you're able to do that. Okay, so now let's get into it. So, Last time we covered, what methods did we cover last time? We covered a very basic linear regression model called least squares, which if you've ever done any statistics, uh, you're probably familiar with. We covered some basic methods, k-nearest neighbors, the perceptron method, and the perceptron method, the reason why I really wanted to cover that and why I was emphasizing that is if you've heard anything about machine learning in the news, you know how neural networks have taken the field by storm. And if you have any desire to do anything with neural networks, you want to understand perceptrons. That's a single, you're simulating a single neuron. And so that's your stepping stone to understanding uh, what's called a network, neural network. Uh, large quantity of neurons. So look at that video if you haven't seen that. But in this talk, and by the way, you don't need to know, you don't have, it's not necessary to have seen that talk to get a lot of value out of this talk. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about additional methods. Now, if you, I don't know if you want to just learn about methods for, you know, oh, for a long time and you want to somehow that's you're going to take pride in learning all kinds of methods or maybe you have a more practical bent and you want to just you know give me your, your attitude is you know give me the most powerful methods the things i can start using right away to get the most bang for my buck if that's your uh your attitude your goals i have i have some some stuff you may like during this talk. And so basically what I'm offering you is kind of a shortcut. You don't have to learn 50 methods. What if I gave you the top, you know, one, two or three methods and you just focus on those? Wouldn't that be, um, wouldn't that be a much more effective use of your time? And so I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna give you tonight as part of this talk, all right? So, continue. So here is an outline. So I will first be discussing decision trees. Then I will be discussing something called ensemble learning. Then I'm gonna talk about two of the most amazing methods you've ever heard of, random forests and gradient boosting, all right? So, but in order to understand everything that follows, you really need to understand this decision trees. So listen up to this part. And by the way, this is easy stuff. That's one of the things you're gonna like about these powerful methods is they're, they're relatively easy to understand, okay? So what is a decision tree? 
if you know what a flow chart is, you already know what a dis decision tree is. So it's a, we're gonna do, we're gonna make a flow chart with, to handle numbers. So it's gonna be a flow chart of inequalities. If, a, if your input, the, if a number is bigger, or smaller than something, then we're gonna go one path if it's, and then there's other paths and you get the idea, all right? Every, Every test, every fork in the road is going to involve a single feature, a single property, a single measurement, a single number. Okay. And this simple idea of a flow chart can be used for classification and regression. So, both major types of supervised learning. Classification, you may recall, is trying to detect, well, certain classes like detecting. Uh, whether a picture is a picture of a cat or a dog or a wolf, right? That's classification. And then regression would be like trying to make a program to uh, predict a stock price, right? Where there's not just a few categories, but there's a, a continuous range. And so we call that regression. So if it wasn't clear already what a decision tree is, again, it's the goal is not to snow you. This is this is all really nice, easy to understand stuff, but really powerful. That's why I like it. So here's an example of a flow chart regarding uh, vectors of numbers. So imagine you wanted to make a program, perhaps for a furniture store, and you wanted to predict based on customer data whether they were going to make a purchase. And the data you had on every customer was their income level, their family size, and their education. So at the very top of my uh, diagram there, you see I have a vector, a, a, a tuple, a, a collection with those three uh, properties, those three measurements, those three numbers, income represented by I, family size by F, education by E. And so the first test, the first question we're going to ask that's going to answer our question about whether this person is going to buy furniture at our store is what is their income? So we'll start with that one. Do they make more than 75,000 a year or do they make less than 75,000 a year? So that's the first fork in the road you see there. So we go down one level. And then the next test is going to involve family size. So let's do the left side first. So the excuse me, the so they have less than seventy five thousand dollars a year in income. So if they have a huge family, so more than four members, well then they uh, they it turns out that they won't buy furniture. Let's pretend that the data says that. All right, and so that is represented by the uh, gray dot, and then moving. Uh, along the left edge there, if they have less than four kids, well, then they will, they, there is a chance they're going to buy furniture this time. So I'm, I'm following, again, I'm following the far left side. They have um, relatively low income, relatively small family size. And then the final test on the bottom left there is their education level. So if they have uh, less than a high school education, then they're going to buy furniture. If they are, if they have more than a high school education represented by education greater than 12, then they won't buy furniture. Maybe we can try to interpret that, that if they have education, they're smart enough to know that, I don't know, they could just use their existing furniture and they don't need to replace it every two years. Right, you get the idea. Okay, on the far right, you see if they have a high, relatively high income, but uh, small family size, they're probably not going to feel the need to buy furniture. Anyways, so this is a decision tree for sets of numbers, vectors of numbers. Okay, and that's really all there is to it. But yet, we're going to really uh, use this simple idea. Okay, now, if another way to understand the same simple idea is geometrically. So, if you think about each of these tests, 
what they're doing is they're saying, okay, I'm going to treat differently if the number is smaller than something or bigger than something. Well, you can imagine how that corresponds to you have some box. And so you're, you're, you're creating walls, right? And you're going to treat points in this box differently if you're on the right or left or above or below the wall. Okay. And so you're different as you add levels to your flow chart to your decision tree, you're adding more. Uh, more and more uh, boxes to make a more uh, sophisticated and accurate model for your what's called your training data. All right. So whether you like the the tree, the upside down tree that I just showed you, or this, take your pick. They both are explaining the same thing. Okay. Now, um, let me just now give you a few more. Uh, uh, let me move now into beyond just the general description into a few low level details. So, and I'll, I'll do it with this geometric interpretation because it's easier, I think, to explain this next part. So, imagine you were going to build your next division. You're going to put your next wall in this picture. So, you can choose to make a horizontal wall or you could choose to make a vertical wall. Now, if you had more features, for example, the, the purchasing flow chart had three features. So in that case, you'd have a three dimensional space. And the point I'm getting at is you are free to make your next division in any dimension you like. So for this two dimensional example, you could make the next wall be vertical or horizontal. Okay. And the way that the decision tree method works is you, you search along both or all the dimensions and you pick the the next wall division whatever you want to call it that most improves your model okay now it looks perfect it, it looks clearly that de decision trees can be used for classification right you uh depending on which box your point falls into you could assign different categories for that but you can also use it for regression if your desired result is uh, a continuous variable. So what you do there, the way that we we use it for regression is we first find what box our point is in, and then we take the average of all the corresponding results for all the points in our training data that are in that box. Okay, so. You can use it again for both classification and regression. Now, here's a one dimensional example of regression. And let me talk through this, this picture, but take a look at it for a second. So, you have some input value, and you're trying to fit a function to this noisy data. So, you see the the data it rises and then it falls and then it kind of rises again so if you know what a sine function is maybe it reminds you of that um, and so uh, how are we going to model this data so we're going to divide the range of input values into different sections and then for each section there's going to be a set of these points that are within that vertical strip Okay, that interval, and then we're going to average again, like I said, that we're going to average the, in this case, the Y values of all those points, the heights, and that's going to give us the height of our, our final uh, regression function. Okay. And so if I, if I move along to the right and I take averages of all the points above and below, wherever I am, you'll see that the, the my regression curve, the, the height keeps adjusting as I keep taking more and more averages. Okay. And so there you have, there you have a very nice pictorial example of decision tree regression. Okay. All right. Now, a couple more reasons to, uh, a, a couple more things I want to point out, put it that way. So, 
with decision trees, you don't need to do any normalization. So if you're familiar with other methods, you have to do things like what's called one hot encoding or take the logarithm of your data. And you basically, you have to be concerned about certain, certain features that have extremely large numbers that are gonna overpower or dwarf other features that have a very small range. Okay, and so that's that's so you do the way you deal with that is it's called normalization. You scale down or up your features. Okay, so you don't need to do that with decision trees, which is kind of nice. It, unlike other methods, you don't get burned by uh, normalization issues. However, decision trees are very susceptible to overfitting. So what do I mean? by overfitting. Well, it means that you did such a good job, you made such a sophisticated model on your training data that it, it's, think about memorizing your training data. So that's all you know, and you're great at that. But now when you have new data, your your model is, is too focused. It's too distorted, contorted to handle the, the training data. And it, it's not, gen, it doesn't generalize as they say, that's enough to handle uh, new unseen data, all right? And then uh, there is a way to avoid overfitting. What you don't wanna do, going back to this picture. So yes, I could, I imagine if I made a microscopic box around every single point, okay? Then I would have 100% accuracy. Right, I would have the right color box for every point and you can't get better than that, right? However, you don't wanna do that. You don't wanna, you don't wanna really dial up the number of boxes. You actually wanna limit that. You, 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 in fact, the picture here is kind of nice. You've got some nice big boxes and that, that might be adequate and this might generalize to unseen data fairly well. So you'd wanna maybe stop here at this, this level. Okay, so the reason I mentioned that is that's how to fight overfitting, which is a, a real concern with decision trees. All right. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get to that. Yes, great question. Can you uh, resample the data? Right. So with that, let that'll be a good segue into what's called ensemble learning. So. We've talked already, uh, we, I've given you a number of methods and there's no reason you have to use just one method, right? You can use multiple methods. In fact, what about if you used multiple methods and you somehow combined the, the results to somehow get a better result? Wouldn't that be a good deal? Okay, so I, there's no reason in general you're forced to stick with one model. So think about when you want to make an important decision. You don't just ask one person, right? You've got hopefully multiple advisors to help you solve a complex problem or make an important decision. And then what do you do? You ask maybe your friends, your family, your pastor, anybody else you respect, and you can either say, okay, this person obviously has experience with this problem, this decision. So I'm going to focus, I'm going to pay attention only to this person. I've, I've decided to ignore everybody else. That's, you could certainly do that. And that might be a wise choice. Or if you're not, it's not really clear. Everybody is, is smart, but nobody seems to have a monopoly on the right answer here. You might imagine taking a vote. Uh, you might imagine going with the answer that most people are recommending. All right. So there's an example of, uh, you might call that ensemble learning, okay? You're, you're taking multiple sources of information to arrive at a, hopefully a better decision. So we're gonna do something similar with machine learning. All right, now it gets even better. The same way that you don't need to use just one method, you also don't need to use your data in, in just one way. So we had a question about resampling. So yes, 
let's resample, let's do whatever we can to just squeeze as much work as we can out of our data, right? We don't, the, the rule in machine learning and, and data science is more data is, is typically better, if not always better, all right? So we really want to uh, get the most out of all the data we have. So how can we do that? Well, here's one way. I'm going to show you two ways, two very common ways. So the first way, uh, this is called k-fold cross-validation. So imagine that each horizontal strip is all your data, okay? And so each of these five strips, five rows, represents the same data. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the same data in slightly different ways five times. So it's going to be like almost like having five times more data. Okay. So the blue boxes represent what we're going to use the data, the portion of the data we're going to use for training to build our model, like our decision tree model. And then the white box represents the smaller fraction of our data that we're going to sequester. And we're going to use that to test our model, right? So that's going to be our quote unquote unseen data we're going to use after the model is built. So in the first row, the top row, I'm using the, you see the box on the right side. So I'm using that piece of the data. And then in the second row, the second copy of the data, I'm using a different portion for the testing. And then you, in each row, I'm using a different portion again for the testing and a different larger uh, subset for the training all right so this is a very powerful technique so people will often train a model like in this case uh five five-fold cross validation is a common uh, technique and so you make five models and then remember my uh, my uh, analogy of the advisors so you could think of each of these models as like five advisors and then you could somehow combine them and hopefully arrive at a better machine learning result. Isn't that cool? So that's a very nice technique to improve the accuracy of your model, okay? Now, every, every, every subset here is independent. There's no overlap, so that's nice. However, you can see we're limited in how many times we can do this, right? We, we pretty much maxed out here at five, five little derivations. So maybe sometimes you want more than that. So what can we do in that situation? So there you might want something called bootstrapping or bagging, it's sometimes called. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to randomly pick elements in our data set, okay? And we're just going to pick as many as we want for our der derived set. So, for example, the bottom left is one derivation. And then we could then go back and start over, pick again randomly a couple of elements, and that'll form our next set. And we can keep redoing this process and randomly picking a subset of the uh, uh, randomly deriving new subsets or new, new derived collections this way, all right? Now, this, with bootstrapping, you can create an unlimited amount of these derived collections, all right? Now, how is that possible? What's going on here? Well, for bootstrapping, we allow redundancy. So it's entirely possible and actually likely that these derived collections, there's gonna be some elements that are present in multiple collections. So you might say that there's overlap. That's another way you could say it. So there's definitely or most likely going to be overlap. Furthermore, when you're picking results from the, the data set, every time we pick a value, we 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 take out a copy, but then we 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 imagine we put it back, put the original element back, and then we randomly sample the data set again. So the what I'm getting at is you can potentially pick the same element multiple times for the same data set, okay? 
the same derived collection. So for example, if you look in the bottom left, you see there's several uh, so what yellow dots okay so we're picking the same one multiple times there's also two red ones so that's the price you have to pay in order to have uh, a large quantity of derived collections all right you have to uh, allow for you have to allow redundancy that's what i'm getting at so so k-fold cross validation and bootstrapping again are two ways to really milk our data for all it's worth to, to really build a much more accurate model. Okay. So th that's a very important concept of ensemble learning. All right. Now, since hopefully now you like ensemble learning, so let's consider, consider this. What about using this idea of ensemble learning? By the way, ensemble just means a collection. Uh, what if we use it for decision trees? So you remember that decision trees were susceptible to overfitting, right? If we picture again that box when we're coloring in the box, we might get some of the colors wrong, right? However, what if you imagine making multiple attempts at coloring the box correctly, right? and we randomly make certain changes so that each of our colorings comes out slightly different. So the hope is, again, think about the, right, there's uh, wisdom in the wisdom of the crowds, the advisors I was talking about. So the hope is somehow you can leverage all those slightly different decision trees to get a much better final result. Okay, and indeed, that's that's what happens. That's what this gets done all the time. All right, now, so how do you how do you combine the outputs, the results of multiple decision trees for your final result? Well, if you're doing classification, right? There's a, a certain number of categories you're looking for. Then you you want to use a voting mechanism. So if if you have 10 decision trees right and eight of them are saying the output should be this and two of them are saying no that's wrong you probably want to listen to the the eight decision trees right so so that's a voting mechanism so that's what you use for classification however if you're doing regression like again trying to pick a stock price or trying to predict the temperature tomorrow the weather right then you you would do averaging right not every result let's go sticking with the weather example if presumably no decision tree is going to predict the the temperature of the weather perfectly right but hopefully if you average the 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 guesses the educated guesses hopefully the errors will somehow cancel out and you'll end up with a better final result all right so that that's what's going on here All right, now, let me, now that I gave you the general idea, again, let me now drop down to the, um, for a few, let me give you a few low level details now. So you will commonly hear this idea of using multiple decision trees as random forests, which is kind of a cutesy name, right? Because you have multiple trees, multiple trees form a forest. Now, however, in order to be called uh, random forests, there has to be certain um, conditions have to be met. So remember we talked about bootstrapping. So if you use bootstrapping to to train your to make the derived collections and you train your trees, your decision trees, each on a different uh, bootstrapping collection, uh, then you're you're following the protocol of random forests. Okay. Also, remember how when we were building our flow chart, I said that at every stage you had to do some test. There was a test over some variable. So we're going to limit the options for each stage. Okay. So we're by the reason why we're we're constraining the 
what we can do at each stage in our decision tree. By the way, we're going to randomly decide what the constraints are. But the reason we're doing that is that's going to force more um, variability, more diversity in our decision trees. Okay, so bootstrapping, right? That that adds randomness. We're randomly building these derived collections, and then we're randomly adding constraints on the feature selection or the directions that we're doing the slices, if you remember my geometric interpretation of a decision tree. And so all of that is gonna make a really nice uh, diverse collection of decision trees that's gonna give you uh, good results. So if you do that, you do those two, you follow those, meet those two conditions, then you get to call your, uh, your set of decision trees a random force. Okay. Now, again, let me let me now talk about um, some good points about random forests. So, again, just there these are built with decision trees, so they inherit a lot of the benefits. So, again, you don't need to worry about normalization. Okay. Furthermore, there's not really a lot of knobs that you have to turn to get this right. Okay, what are the knobs? What are the parameters you can adjust? Well, you can certainly adjust the number of decision trees you want to work with, right? The number of advisors, obviously. And then you can adjust how deep, how how deep your tree goes, your decision tree, right? You can also adjust the constraints. Remember, I, I on the features you're allowed to use at each stage. So that's really that's about it. So you can imagine trying a few choices, comparing the results, and that's not too bad. And lo and behold, you have, you just, congratulations, you just became a successful uh, machine learning engineer. Okay, now it gets even better. So you've got these decision trees, and right, we, we're gonna, we have these, these uh, derived subsets using, ba using bagging or, or uh, bootstrapping, and we're building these decision trees all independently of each other. So you can do that uh, in parallel. A lot of us have computers with multiple cores, or you might have access to multiple computers in the cloud. So you can build, you can have, you can assign the task of building a portion of your decision trees to, to multiple, to different cores, to different machines. And so that is very nice if you wanted to you know, train a massive random forest model. You can you can build it much quickly, much more quickly because it's parallelizable, right? So that's a very nice result. Now, if you're if it sounds like I love random forest, well, there's a reason for that, and I think if you're not convinced, then I have a very powerful argument. This is why you're getting your money's worth if you are listening to this talk. All right, so remember I said that you may or may not want to spend the next two years studying hundreds of machine learning models. You might just want to say, okay, give me, just give me the best stuff. And I just want to focus on that. Well, here's a paper that speaks to that. So um, a group of people, literally, they analyzed hundreds of classifiers. And they had they analyzed several families of classifiers, several uh, versions of classifiers within these several families, and they analyzed all of these methods on a massive number of data sets. And their goal was to say, okay, what what is the absolute best uh, method? What should we use if we're going to do machine learning right? What how should we do it? Okay which is, a, I, I think you'd agree, that would be a nice question to know the answer to. And so here is from the abstract, and I've highlighted probably the, the part that uh, you wanna pay attention to the most. Of course, I encourage you to read the whole paper, but um, uh, let me just read a portion of what's in yellow. So at the top, they, you see how hard they work. So they evaluated 179 classifiers with from 17 families okay so you see 
they start listing out the, all the 17 families there. Some of these you may have heard of, some of these you may not have heard of. So the neural networks, we've talked about that there on the second line. Look at decision trees is right there on the second line as well. On the third line, you see their random forests, okay? So they analyzed all 17 of these families and they analyzed several versions of those 17 families. And then look at the bold there in the middle. They used 121 data sets. So they are really running these, these candidate methods into the ground. And so what was the result of this massive effort? Well, look at the bottom highlighted portion. The classifiers most likely to be the best bets are the random forest versions. The best of which, and then they show you a high accuracy. So it's almost like miracles happen when you use random force. So like that is um, something you definitely want to pay attention to. And so with that, you may not again have a need again to study, you know, hundreds of of model techniques to uh, have a good career, right? So with that, you might wonder, well, we could almost stop the talk right there. We could almost just learn random forest and we're good to go, right? Maybe throw in a little neural networks uh, education for fun. But so what, uh, what else do we have to talk about? Well, let me add one more variate, one more method that's based on decision tree that you should pay attention. So just like random forests were hugely important, it turns out I am only adding the best stuff in this talk. So it turns out this is an extremely important method you also want to add to your quiver. Okay. And what we're going to do here is just to prepare you, just to show you what's coming in the next couple of minutes. So the I so random forest, if you just want the most bang for your buck, you want the best model. For the least amount of effort, okay, yeah, that in general, the paper says that's the way to go. Okay. However, if you're really willing to wear yourself out and do a lot more work to squeeze out that extra little ounce of, of accuracy, okay, if that's your attitude, if your attitude isn't just, you know, give me the most bang for the, the minimum effort. If that if you have the attitude of I I want to, you know, special forces, I want to win some machine learning contest. So I, every little fraction of a percent gain in accuracy is important to me. I don't care if I have to spend an extra couple weeks to get it. Okay. If that if that's where you're at, then gradient boosting, that's why we need to talk about that in addition to random forests. Okay. So that you see why uh, it may or may not be your uh, choice depending on what your needs are. So let me now with that introduction let me um, give you more details about gradient boost. So with random forests, we, we, we built these independent decision trees, right? What we're gonna do here instead is we're gonna be a little bit more careful, a little bit more involved in each follow on decision tree that we build, okay? we're going to do a little bit more work. What we're going to do is we're going to make one decision tree. Then we're going to say, okay, well, how good is it? What are the errors? What are the weaknesses? And then when we make our next decision tree, we're going to say, okay, how can I improve on that first decision tree? Well, that, that makes sense, right? So now we're going to make it a little better and then we can repeat it again. How can, now that I have these two decision trees, let's analyze the error there. And how can I correct for that? Hopefully decreased error, all right? And you can imagine adding more and more decision trees all day long and slowly creeping towards perfection, all right? If you're willing to do that work, then you can see how this might give you a very powerful model, okay? Um, now, uh, again, let me repeat, these follow on decision trees are there to improve, to offset previous errors. Okay. 
Now, here is, again, I encourage you if you're interested in really being, you know, super macho in machine learning, you'll want to read up more on gradient boosting. But let me just kind of whet your appetite here. So every row here is a, a different stage in your gradient boosting procedure. All right, so we're going to start at the top. That's going to be our first decision tree. You see it right there in the first row. And then the next one is going to be in the next row. And so each stage, we're going to move down row by row to get our final model. Okay, so you see there on the on the left column, we're going to use the same inputs for each stage, right? We're going to, we want to train our model on the same inputs. But notice that our outputs, notice our goal is going to be different. By the way, I represents all the input data and O represents the outputs, what we want the model to, to give us if we plug in the inputs. Okay, that wasn't clear. And then the capital T, that represents the different decision trees, so T for tree. And then R, capital R on the far right, residuals. So a residual is basically the error. Now there's different ways to define an error function. The residual is probably the most natural one that you would think to use. You simply take the difference, right? Your model gave you some number, but you really wanted this other number. So that you, the difference, that the difference between what you want, and what you got, that's the error, okay? That simple type of error, that's what a residual is, okay? So no big deal. All right, so let me now explain, let me talk more about the first row. So there we're gonna start out with a totally brainless model, okay? Where it doesn't even matter what the input data is for on the first row. All we're gonna do is the first model is just gonna always output the average of the output data. You see there on the bottom left, so the tree, the zeroth tree is just it always you no matter what input you give it, it's gonna spit out the average of all the values that you want. Okay, so not very useful, right? So nevertheless, let's press on. So first row, far right. So let's calculate the error in that crummy model. So that's the R sub zero, the the residuals of the uh, tree zero. All right, so far so good. Now, let's look at what's happening in the second. Okay, so R sub zero, those are, that's the error. We really don't want that. We wanna get rid of that. Okay, what's the logical thing to do? Why don't we make a decision tree that somehow spits out the opposite of our errors? Okay, how cool is that? So if you look there on the second column, the goal for my next decision trees is minus R zero. So we want to we want to make a machine that's gonna that's gonna exactly offset the original errors. Now, obviously, if I combine those two decision trees, now I have a better model, right? And so and so uh, that's that's basically that's it. That's gradient boosting in a nutshell. And so I, we then on the far right of the second row, you see the R one. So we 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 find the errors again or the residuals, and then. The third row, now we make another model to try to offset those errors, okay? And we just keep repeating this as many times as you like. And then there, there you have it. And then uh, the, and so then we, we use all of those decision tree models. And so that forms our hopefully powerful gradient boosting model, right? Now, um, again, you'll, if you're interested in this, you'll, uh, want to spend a lot more time uh, reading up on it, but hopefully that's a nice introduction. Um, let me let me also say one thing. This, if you remember the perceptron method, you may remember that we were, we creep, we also creeped up to our answer, right? There was something called a learning rate. And I gave you the analogy of trying to, trying to uh, walk down a mountain in the dark with a small flashlight and you kept adju ad adjusting the direction of your step. And so the learning rate is kind of like the size of your step. And so you don't want to take too big of a step because you might crash into a tree. Uh, the an the an analog here is you're going to have numerical issues if you take too big of a step. 
So what does that have to do with radiant boosting? Well, it turns out you you don't want to these none of these decision trees are going to exactly offset the error. So you're not just going to combine trees. And, oh yeah, now you have a perfect model. So what we're going to do is we don't want to we don't want to we only want to combine, we only want to take a little bit of what the next model is offering us. Okay. So we want to take a little step in the right direction. So that's that's um, represented by the bottom right. So that's why you see the models after T0, they have a prime. So we're not going to take the actual model by training on, on the second column. We're actually going to multiply that model by a small number. Okay. The results by a small number, and so the, we're going to use that. Those adjusted, those prime models are going to go into our gradient boosting. Uh, and again, our method. Again, that's to avoid numerical issues that come if you try to you get too ambitious and try to jump to the right answer too fast. Okay. All right. So as I said. Gradient boosting is often more accurate than random forests. In fact, there is this amazing library called XGBoost. So I don't know how much you know about machine learning and machine learning contests, but if you were to research it, uh, maybe you wanted to win some contests to show everybody how great you are at making models, you would find out that a lot of these contests are won by gradient boosting methods. All right. Furthermore, a lot of these gradient boosting practitioners use this library called XGBoost. So a lot of people love this library. In fact, in my job, I use XGBoost. Okay. So you'll find a lot of love for XGBoost. And so uh, if you want to do some real work, you'll, you definitely want to look more into that. Okay. So I just wanted to Introduce that because this, if you read a lot of stuff on the web, talk to different people, you'll see this come up a lot. So I wanted you to know what it was. Okay. All right. So again, if gradient boosting is so awesome and it wins contests, why wouldn't you want to just use it all the time? Okay. So to to uh, let, let me address that question. So it's it's much harder to get this method right. So you you saw that number that I multiplied. Let me go back here on the bottom right. See that little L that that small number. That's that's called the learning rate. Okay, figuring out the correct small the best small number. Well, that's it turns out that that's a task in itself. Also, knowing how many rows here, how many decision tree models to use. Well, that's that's another task in itself as well. And then you you recall that in order to make decision trees, there was this there was um, some adjustments we could make there. So the number of knobs we can adjust is adding up. All right. And so it's going to take you more time. Again, you're not going to you can't be a hero for free. So you're going to have to do a lot more work if you want the glory here. All right. Also, if you really want to creep towards perfection, you take lots and lots of little steps and just build a massive number of decision trees. Well, that's going to cost a lot of uh, compute time. All right. So be prepared to pay for your awesome model. Okay. So that's all I want to say about that. Now, if that wasn't uh, enough to have to consider, also, Remember, it's sequential, right? It's you. It's not parallelizable. So with random forest, you could build your all those decision trees in parallel. Here, you can't do that because the next decision tree depends on all the previous ones. Okay, so that's another thing to consider. All right. However, if if you're okay, if you're willing to do this extra work, if you're willing to pay the extra resources, then yes, by all means, uh, do use gradient boosting, okay? Now, however, there's one more bit of bad news in closing, and then I'll uh, 
finish uh, what I have to say. So gradient boosting is much more prone to overfitting. Okay. Again, remember when I was talking about the decision tree and I said, you don't want to color, you don't want to get too intense with all kinds of little patches, little bo rectangles, boxes of different colors, because that's, we call that overfitting. Well, gradient boosting uh, can do the same thing. Yes, you'll make an awesome model of your training data, but that's not your goal. Your goal is to make an awesome model for future data, for unseen data. So you have to really be aware of that, okay? It is much more susceptible, right? We know how random forest took care of this concern by by um, averaging the values, by using a voting mechanism or averaging the values. Well, here, um, well, uh, we don't have that, okay? So now also overfitting becomes more and more of a problem the more features or the higher the dimension of your data, all right? So if you have, I don't know, what's something that has a lot higher, high dimension? So think about, uh, I don't know, like some kind of genetics uh, application where you have a map, you know, I don't know, all this genetics data and you're trying to build a super bot. Well, there you are going to have an unbelievable problem with overfit. Okay. So much of a problem, you might just, you know, throw in the towel and say, you know, I just, this is too much. This is, I can't get this right. Maybe I need to fall back on random forest. All right, so don't get the impression that gradient boosting, gradient boosting is going to always be the decision that you should make. Okay, so you want to have random forest and gradient boosting in your back pocket. All right, and both of those together are unbelievably powerful, uh, uh, powerful tools that you, in your quiver. All right.